שלום. שלום לכם. אני פה עם מיסטר טום טומרקין, CEO of USCL in Sacramento, California. And I'm also with Jonathan Topper in his office, our patent attorney in Jerusalem. And uh, welcome here, it's Chanukah, Chag Sameach to both of you. Thank you. Uh, we have a few questions for our investors about patents. אני כאן במשרדו, כמו שאמרתי, של ג'ונתן טופר, עורך הפטנטים שלנו בירושלים, ויש לנו כמה שאלות עבור המשקיעים שלנו לגבי פטנטים. granted patent in the EU and one pending in the EU. Of all the patents, I think this is probably the one that's the most special to us because it is the first day of Hanukkah. We are in Jerusalem, and Hanukkah is the story of an abundance of oil. And our patent has to do with uh, conservation of energy. And for those of you that know the story of Hanukkah, uh, one day's worth of oil actually extended for eight days. So this is very special to me. Thank you. Wonderful, so let's start with the first question. What is a patent? A patent is actually a prohibitive right, which means to say that if, some, if somebody has an invention for a product or a process that they want to stop other people from infringing, then they take out a patent which gives them limited protection in a particular jurisdiction, and that protection allows them to prevent other people from doing what is actually embraced by the patent. And historically, a patent was given by the government in order to encourage people to make their inventions known. So that after the monopoly, after the term of monopoly of the patent expires, then the knowledge that was uh, actually embraced by the patent then becomes public property. Great. So uh, let's, uh, let's continue. Yeah. How are patents drafted? Patents are drafted basically, it's a, a cooperation between the inventor and the patent attorney. The inventor explains what he's done. Usually he has some sort of problem that he wanted to solve. Um, and the patent attorney has to have some knowledge of what, the, what was done beforehand. Often the inventor will provide that information, although there was search, mm -hmm. in order to establish what we, we call a baseline, which determines what was known before the inventor actually came up with his idea. And then you have to have a full technical description that has to be at a level that somebody else who reads that patent application will understand exactly how to carry out the patent without him having to actually invent anything on his own. That's a very important thing, because the disclosure does have to be complete. You can't keep secrets up your sleeve, because if it then can be shown that um, key elements of the, of, the, of the technology were not made available, and that without that you can't actually carry out the invention, then retroactively the patent could be revoked. And having done that, the most important part of the patent is what's called the claims. Okay. And the claims determine the legal scope of monopoly. All right. Mm. So, in fact, uh, what are the important sections of a patent and what is their purpose? Well, I would say basically there are three different sections. The first section is called the background, which sets out the problem that you want to solve and what was done beforehand. And if there were drawbacks with what was done beforehand, what are those drawbacks? Why you see a need, therefore, to try and make an improvement? The second section is the um, detailed description, which actually sets out in detail for one of, of what is called skill in the art, mm -hmm. so that he will know how to carry out the invention based on your description and technical, technical disclosure. Okay. And the third part is the claims, which sets out in legal language so. the scope of monopoly. Why is the claims section of a patent so important? The claims are important because they are what actually sets out set out the legal scope of monopoly and what you can actually prevent somebody legally from doing. What is the value of a patent, actually? The value of a patent depends how you want to measure the value, okay? I would say for a startup, very often, the, the, the value of the company is largely the value of the patents, okay? The primary source of, uh, the, the primary asset, actually, of a startup company okay. is the patent. And if you want to secure investment, and this is, of course, we're talking about investors. Investors want to make sure, okay, that if they're going to pump money into a new company, 
that having done that and, and brought the product to the market, that somebody else cannot then come along and have all the benefit of the knowledge that is disclosed by the patent and do it without infringing the claims of the patent. So from their point of view, the, uh, the patent is very important, okay? And the claims, of course, are very important. The, the scope of the claims should be sufficiently broad to make it very difficult for somebody else to come along, okay? On the other hand, for a, an established company, um, the value of the patent lies in the ability to sue infringers okay. and to make sure that, I mean, you've just seen what's happened between Apple and Samsung, for example, the class example, okay? But um, patents basically are, are, are used in order to, to gain a foothold into the market and to establish the foothold once it's been made. Okay. Good. Mm. How can patents be monetized? Our next question. Um, well, it's not my major field of expertise, I have to be honest with you. Okay. Um, but I would say that in the first instance, of course, as I said before, the, first of all, the investors, okay, they have a much clearer understanding of, of what the monetary value of a patent is and how to monetize the, the patent. Um, if, on the other hand, you are basically selling IP, there are companies, for example, like uh, IBM, okay, which yes. make a fortune on the licensing of their technology, and they obviously have people who are in-house and they're going to do market research in order to establish what the value of their, of their IP is, and on that basis, they will make a determination. How they do that, I'm not really capable of telling you. Fine. That's a very important point, yes. because in our case, the way that we intend to use the patent, and Sue, as you asked, monetize the patent, has to do with licensing the end user of the patent, which in our instance um, is the utility company. Okay, huh? wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, what does the concept of a single end user mean? Okay. Um, if you have a, an invention, okay, some, let me give you two examples. Okay. If you have a simple example of a, of a fountain pen, okay, so that fountain pen is inevitably used by one person. Only one person can use a fountain pen at a time. Okay, and you have a claim that sets out what that fountain pen is and how it's constructed and what the particular novelty of the fountain pen is. And then you hope that, uh, that that is a good claim and that if somebody else does something similar that they will be infringing that claim. But there are many inventions today that, are, that relate to what are called distributed systems, mm -hmm. where you have more than one component, at least two, maybe even more than two. And it's only the integration of those components that allows you to realise something which is you, new and useful. So your patent really relates to an integrated, um, an integration of several different components. And yet, um, you have to find a way of protecting it so that any one person who does his bit, okay, maybe manufacturing one particular component or maybe using one of those components, you want to make sure that he's actually infringing the patent. Now, in the case of this particular invention, this particular yeah. product, we are talking about a, a distributed system because we're talking about a utility meter that, has an adva that basically will sit in a, in a, in a person's home mm -hmm. and that has hardware that enables it, uh, hardware integrated with software, which enables it to transmit information relating to particular utility consumption. Be, could be, it's in this particular case, it's electricity, but it could, it could be water, it could be gas, okay? And it will transmit that information to a central repository where it will be processed, okay? And then it will be sent on further, okay, for further analysis, okay? And then, as I understand it in this particular case, the electrical company can actually take actions dependent on the information that was transmitted to it from the domestic or, or residence or the factory or wherever it is. Yes. So you have, in other words, a bi-directional communication between the consumer and the utility company itself. And um, therefore, you have to determine, OK, my product can be infringed by somebody putting that a similar product in the end user's home. Mm -hmm. But it can also be infringed by an action taken by the utility company or by somebody who wants to do something similar to the utility company. Mm -hmm. And as, in the, as far as single user is concerned, the single user would either be the end user or it would be the utility company itself. Now, when you have a system like this, you generally don't want to go after the end user. Okay, mm -hmm. for lots of different reasons. Okay, one is, of course, that it's 
extremely difficult to go after vast, vast numbers of potential infringers. And the second thing is that it's not very good for public, uh, for, your, for your marketing, okay? okay. You, for public appeal, okay? Uh, we, we can't sue homeowners. You don't want to, okay? And the same way, for example, that, mm -hmm. you know, if Microsoft, for example, were to sue a 12-year-old kid who might be a, you know, a whiz kid at uh, computers, uh, right. it wouldn't do very much good for the, for the image of Microsoft. They might exactly. possibly win the case. And even if they do win the case, okay, what are they actually going to get? From a 12-year-old kid, okay? Yes. For awards. I understand. So you want to have make sure that you have claims that are infringed or will inevitably be infringed by the utility company, mm -hmm. and that is really what single end user is, okay. where you have a claim that can be that yeah. has meaning, commercial meaning, yes. as far as the sort utility of is concerned. Of yes. I see. Now, what stands out about Tamarkin and UCL's approach? to its patents? Um, from my personal point of view as a patent attorney, it's very unusual for me, indeed, to represent f um, foreign clients, and I represent mainly foreign clients, okay. where the inventor or the, the CEO of the company himself takes an active interest um, on a one-to-one -one basis with me. And that is something which certainly sets Tom apart from most of my foreign clients. Because most of my foreign clients, I work with a, a legal company, in the same way that Tom works with a, a law company or an IP company in the States. And normally I would work with, uh, with Tom's I or the inventors or the company's IP um, representative in his country of origin. I would never see the inventor. Yeah. I would not know who he is. No. Okay? And uh, to be honest with you, I wouldn't take that much interest in the product either. Okay? Because mm. very often you get copious instructions from the, the, um, from the company, from, from the IP firm that, with whom okay. you're working. Um, they basically set out the scope of the claims that they want. You don't therefore know the background okay, that goes behind it okay, um, in terms of the, the particular nuances that the, the company itself, the, in other words, the, the patentee, is actually looking for. And even in the, you know, the half-hour discussion that we had this morning, okay, where Tom mm -hmm. set out the, the exactly. importance, okay, it's, a, it's a great advantage because it enables you to see the, the, the commercial importance of patents in a way that you don't normally see with a foreign client. You do with, of course, with a local client, but not much, much less so with a foreign client. Okay. And it is for that reason, that precise reason, that I've spent time in Shanghai mm -hmm. working with the folks that helped us draft the, uh, the Chinese patent, mm -hmm. and of course certainly with you here in Israel. All right, and our last question is, why do so many companies seek patents in Israel? I think that um, uh, one, of the, one of the main reasons is, is of course, the, the intellectual property. But intellectual property in a place where the intellect is, is the major asset of the, of the, of the, uh, That's what I of thought. the country, <laughs> I think, is a major consideration. Okay. Many, many uh, foreign companies are doing their major, uh, have you know, major development outlets in, in Israel. Uh, Microsoft is an obvious example. It's by no means the only example. <laughs> IBM has had a large development, they have a very large development facility in Haifa. Um, along the coastal road as you go to Herzliya, you come from Herzliya, well okay, right. but I'm in Herzliya, and of course on the way en route to Haifa, you've got vast, vast numbers, you see all these companies, all of which are doing development in Israel. From their point of view, it's relatively cheap to do so, they have excellent expertise, mm -hmm. and therefore it makes sense, of course, to uh, make sure that the, in the intellectual property that lies behind those inventions will be protected also in Israel. Very good. Very good, thank you very much. Toda Raba. Toda Raba Tom, thank you. I was the founder of this company in roughly 2001 at a time in the United States when we had tremendous problems with our electrical distribution system and in fact we had blackouts and brownouts in, in California. So I developed the technology and worked closely with counsel in the United States to go through the patent process and we did that uh, with the international patents in mind, having made that initial uh, you know, set of disclosures. So this was a case where not only am I representing the company today, but I am in fact the inventor, if you will, of uh, this concept and this technology. And uh, very much our company is responsible for uh, pushing the regulators of the utility industry in the United States into uh, forcing the adoption of this uh, technology throughout the United States, which has very uh, 
powerful, large uh, ramifications on the commercial, uh, commercial end, which is why our strategy has been for the last several years focusing on the refinement of, of the claims so that our claims are as uh, broad and defendable as possible. And one thing that we didn't speak about regarding um, patents is the way that a patent can be challenged, a way that uh, we, as an example, in the United States, um, if we're not very careful early on, a large company may recognize the value of our IP or our patents, and they could, they could sue us. They could actually file a lawsuit against me and our inventors and our company because the patents are assigned to the company, the theory being that we threatened them, so they take a very offensive uh, position and file for something called a declaratory judgment, mm -hmm. and then we're faced with hundreds of thousands of dollars of uh, legal expenses. So that is why for the last three or four years, in various presentations that I've made with our financial backers, I've used the phrase, we've been very careful to uh, stay under the radar, so to speak, mm -hmm. until the final patent, uh, which was filed uh, about three weeks ago in the U.S., until we're well through that process and, and we get through the first or second office action. Mm -hmm. Because we simply cannot afford, as a small company, to be sued, um, nor do we want to be put through the process of what's called uh, re-examination. Mm 